but just how God is interested in our heart and how before we can build, there's got to be some kind of desire uh, to build. Um, you've all had building projects or projects at home that you're not motivated to do. Um, or they get done, they get half done, and uh, they never get done. And uh, it's just like taking medicine, right, uh, to do it. And so um, one of the things about building um, in, uh, one of the things about building is God actually kind of puts a little recipe together and he's, he's looking for our heart first. And once he has our heart, he can build. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, uh, so we've been just been talking about things over the last few weeks and motivations and reasons for why God um, should have our heart, why he deserves our heart, why um, not giving him our heart and where all the consequences that go with that. Um, we've been looking at all those things, and so now everything that we end up talking about here, uh, what, what, once you get that down, the whole world opens up. Every, everything here is line upon line, precept upon precept. Everything in the Word of God now becomes something that we build upon. And so, um, anyway, so we've, we're starting our missions month here. We've got all kinds of missions things going on, and we're talking about prayer and missions, and all that kind of goes together. I'm in mean, this month and the seven days of fasting. So there's your exciting times, but these, this is some foundational things that we can um, start looking at for our Christian life to grow it and to build it. But um, there's a good story in, um, in Acts chapter 12, and we're going to be talking about uh, prayer a little bit today and just kind of look at some things. But let's look at Acts chapter 12, starting in verse 1. It says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. <clears throat> And uh, those days could be coming in our country, but here you have the uh, leader, um, the local leader in that area, and he's reached, he's stretching forth his hands to start taking some of the leaders in the church and persecuting them. It says, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Um, it says, then were the days of unleavened bread. Um, and when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to the to four quaternions of soldiers um, to keep him, intending after Easter uh, to bring him forth to the people. Um, if you have a King James Bible, um, that word Easter there is the only it's the only translation English translation that uses the word Easter, um, and it does it so appropriately. If your Bible doesn't say Easter there. If you have a Scofield Bible, you can cross out the note there that says Passover, if you want to, because Easter is the right translation um, in doing that. But that's one of the things that makes your King James Bible unique, makes it stand out from every other version in the Bible, or uh, any other versions out there that makes it the Word of God. Um, but anyway, just a little unique thing there. I won't go into that today. Verse 5, Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. All right, if we could, we could probably spend all day on just the phrase, but prayer. This was a hopeless situation. Um, he, it's, it's inevitable that he, it's imminent that he is going to die. They're just waiting for their pagan holiday to finish up. And as soon as it does, they're bringing Peter out. And he's going to face the same uh, uh, fate as as James. It's already been predetermined. His, he's already been sentenced. He's already got his his date and when he's going to be executed. He's being guarded by four quaternions of soldiers. He's deep in the prison. You know, from a uh, if you were a betting person uh, that Peter's going to escape and get out, you wouldn't put any money on this situation. But prayer. But prayer you forgot about that but prayer and so um anyways that's what we see in this story right here uh uh god is the x factor in this and it's that way in our in our christian life and so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna, I'm gonna read through this story and we're gonna go back through this i want to go i want to i want to i'm gonna take two there are two things going on in this story two places that 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 god is doing work and we're gonna look at that and we're gonna kind of look at the story a little bit um, allegorically and run back through it. But I'm going to read through it first and then we'll come back through it through it again. Uh, it says, um, 
Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without uh, ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up. Uh, I love that Peter was just sleeping. I mean, he's he's going to be executed in a few days. He's just sleeping. Um, hey, you, you can rest in the Lord, right? And um, uh, But he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands, and the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not, that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. Now, I don't know about you. I can totally relate to Peter right here. Because when I wake up in the morning, I wake up from a deep sleep and I don't know what's going on. Um, I, it takes me a little while to figure out, am I, am I, uh, am, am I still in a dream or what, what's going on here? And, um, you know, sometimes I... All right, anybody had a dream within a dream? <laughs> All right, within a dream? All right, you wake up and you think you're in reality and you're not? And so... Anyways, uh, um, so anyways, I, I I I know what Peter's talking about here, and so uh, anyways, verse ten it says when they were uh, when they were past the first and the second or when they were past the first and the second ward, they came into the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord, and they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him, and when Peter was come to himself. That was a come, that was a, that was a, what, you talk about a come to Jesus moment right there. It's like, whoa, what, what am I doing here? And, uh, and that's where he's at. He says, now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand, you think, of the Herod. And from all the expectation of the, uh, of the people of the Jews, and when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark where many were gathered together praying. Now, verse 13. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, the damsel came, a, a damsel came to hearken, uh, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness. That sounds like, that sounds like an excited person, right? But ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. I mean, if you're Peter out there, you're probably going, open the gate, <laughs> open the gate, where are you going? Open the gate. And she runs back in. She doesn't let him in, right? And so, um, and, and they said unto her, thou art mad. Um, and so they're praying for Peter and Peter shows up at the door and she tells him he's at the door and he says, you're mad and, um, you're crazy. That would be, that's how we would say today. You're crazy. Um, but she constantly affirmed that it was, that way it was even so then said they, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished and he beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison and he said go show these things unto James and his brethren departed and went unto another place <clears throat> great story here of prayer and uh and God places this here on purpose but I, I, I'd like to I'd like to just um walk through some things in this story just to kind of show in parallel what's going on so we have um, um I'm going to have this box here this is going to be where the church is at, where Rhoda, or where Mary's at, where Rhoda's at, um, and we'll, let's call this the, uh, let's call this the church, and I'll just put praying in here, this box, and then in this box, here, I'm going to keep this kind of open-ended, because so I don't know where my list is going to stop, but this is Peter. Peter in prison. All right, now we're going to walk through this story. And um, this is a story about prayer. And this is a story about God answering prayer. And this is a story about God acting upon prayer. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look through the story here. And we're just going to outline the actions that take place in this story. So, um, is what we have here. So, if we said, um, <clears throat> we said um, in verse six, it says, "When when Herod would have brought him forth, it says the same night." Um, I'm going to keep my uh, Bible in my hand. The same night, it says, "Peter 
uh, was sleepy. Oops. Sorry about the pen, guys. Well, see if I can write down this. Peter was sleepy. All right? And then um, it says, uh, um, but he was sleeping between two soldiers, and he was bound. He's bound with chains. So this is kind of describing the situation a little bit. He's bound in chains. And then it says... Um, um, I'm going to say uh, with, oh, that's getting worse. Let me see if I got it. Mr. Record's going to get you one. Oh, yes, okay. All right, okay. Um, it says bound with, uh, <laughs> it's like really getting bad now. Hang on. That's a, that's a little bit better. Um, bound with chains. <laughs> You read that, right? Yeah, All right. Um, oh, oh, I did it again. Is that what you're laughing at? No, you got to lick it. Oh. Okay. Uh, right, no um, junior high there. Junior high there. Uh, okay, that's all. Let me get, uh, I might actually have That looks like a sharpie. <laughs> no, it does say erase marker. It does say erase. Let's see here. Let's try this. Make sure it erases. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Okay. Bound in chains. Um, kept by keepers. I feel like there's more. Oh, thank you, Lily. Kept by keepers, right? Um, and then it says in verse 7, it says, um, it says, uh, the Lord came upon him. All right, that was another action. Um, the light shine. Light shine. In prison. And then it says, um, he smote Peter. Peter smitten. And then it says, in, let's see, what's next? Um, I lost my place. Uh, he smote Peter, and then he raised him up, right? Are you guys following me in verse 7? Yes. Yes. All right, raised him up. <laughs> Looking at actions here. Raised him up, and then... Um, chains fell off. Chains fell off. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. You guys are catching on. Chains fell off. Chains fell off. Chains fell off. Verse 8. Now, gird thyself. An interesting one. Gird thyself, because um, probably wasn't dressed right in prison. Probably had him with no clothes. Bind on thy sandals. Uh, let's see. What's the next one? Um, it says, and so he did. Um, that was his response. Um, cast his garment. On himself. All right, and then um, follow me. Very good. Follow me. Um, and he went. And followed. So that's what went on in here. Now let's look at um, it says when he considered the verse 12, it says he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together. So in this box here, there were um, 
Christians gathered together. Remember, this is going on at the same time. And even before these things happened. Christians were gathered together. What were they doing? Praying. 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 Um, and Peter knocked on the door at the gate. And then it says, um, and when Peter knew the voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in. And he told Peter, he stood before the gate, and he said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed it was so. Then said they, it is an angel. So I'm just, I'm just going to say there as a, as a summary of that. They were not only, they were not only praying, but um, I think we can all relate to this. But they were praying with little faith. Yeah. <laughs> you ever been really surprised when you've been praying for something and God answers it and you're like, what? <laughs> that couldn't have been. He like, the, 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 a pastor told me this story a long time ago. He was using it as an illustration of prayer. But well, this guy's uh, uh, he's working on his roof. And he's, he's hammering in it, and all of a sudden he starts to slip, and he starts sliding down the roof. And as he's sliding down the roof, he's saying, oh, God, please help me. Please help me. And as he's sliding down the roof, his suspenders gets caught on a nail, and he stops right before he gets to the edge. And he goes, oh, never mind, God, the nail got me. Oh. <laughs> That's how we are. That's how we are. So, okay, never mind, God. Uh, no, what, God answers prayer, right? And we're surprised and often even don't recognize uh when he when he uh, uh, answers our prayer, but here I mean it's very obvious they're they're praying not expecting yep. that prayer to get answered. You ever prayed like that? Yeah. I prayed like that, right? I pray that, but it's like oh, I know you're not going to answer this one. And there's just no way it's ever going to get answered. But I'm going to pray anyways because I told somebody I pray. <laughs> so anyways, you can relate to this story, right? And so, um, anyways, is that you're mad? Uh, but she constantly affirmed that it was even so. And they said it is angel. Uh, but Peter continued knocking. When they'd opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Uh, he beckoned into them with the hand. And so, anyways, I'll, I'm just going to stop right there. I just want to look at these two boxes, right? <coughs> I don't, you can't even read my writing. I can't read my writing. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell it to you. In this box here, you have the church gathered together praying. Praying even with little faith. Maybe there's some in there that had faith. You know, I don't know. There was a group of people. Um, but they were praying continually uh, for Peter um, and doing that. In fact, in verse 5, it says, Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made um, without ceasing. We could even put that here, um, prayer without ceasing. And that doesn't mean that somebody... Uh, uh, you know, didn't go to sleep or didn't go to work or whatever. It could mean that they had uh, uh, maybe like a 24-hour vigil, kind of like our fasting calendar where we've always got somebody fasting. In the church, they probably agreed that maybe somebody would always be praying um, as a church. Um, it could be that, um, uh, that, that, that they constantly, so many times a day, pray. For, I, don't, I don't know all what the without ceasing I mean. It's not, the, it's not the ridiculous definition that they were up, you know, 24 by 7 all days a week praying uh, for Peter, but they did not, the church did not cease from praying for Peter. They wanted God to intervene. Somebody in leadership there said, hey, this is what we're going to do and organize this thing. And they all bought in and got in on it. And God did this. Now look at this list here. Um, if I look at this list and I think of Somebody I'm praying for, I just think of somebody, uh, uh, a lost heart. Somebody who's, it could be a Christian who's struggling. It could be somebody that we're trying to pray for their salvation. It could be the souls that we're praying for in this valley that we don't even know, haven't met yet. Um, they're sleeping. They're bound in chains. They're kept by keepers, spiritually. In this case, physically, it was four quaternions of soldiers. Picture that spiritually. <clears throat> in a, that that uh, people are bound by their sin. They're bound by satanic forces that keep it. You can read, you can read that in Luke where, uh, uh, where um, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the description where God talks about the strong man. 
and the one that's stronger than him, and he keeps them bound, and he, he wants to keep his goods um, at peace. And um, But he's bound in chains and kept by keepers. That's what we face. How in the world am I going to reach into a spiritual world that has that going on in somebody's life? It's not going to be, it's not going to be by, uh, I mean, it's not going to be by any kind of dynamic or charisma or personality or things like that. The only person who can do this is God. Amen. And we got to tap into that. But look at this, bound in chains, kept by keepers. The next time you pray for a loved one, have this mental picture in your mind of the state that they're in. And that that soul is being kept by quaternions of spiritual forces that don't want anybody in. And so bound by chains, kept by keepers, and then the Lord came upon him. This is the result of this. This is, this is cause. This is effect. Cause and effect. Then the Lord came upon him. You know what? When the Lord comes up, when the Lord shows up on the scene, those those four Quaternion soldiers don't matter. It don't matter. The Lord came upon him. The light shined in a prison. He's in a very dark place. Peter's in a very dark place. This is not no fault of his own, but we're just looking at the actions that were taken by the Lord as a result of prayer. The light shined in the prison. Peter was smitten. Look, I don't know if you've ever prayed for somebody like this. I have prayed sometimes. I've, I've said, God, whatever you have to do to my loved one or my friend or my son, I said, God, I don't, I don't want them hurt in any way. I want to, but God, all things are on the table. If it means they break a leg, if it means that they uh, have some loss in their life, I, God, whatever it takes to save that soul, you smite them if that's what, if that's what it requires because that soul is way more important than any physical condition here on this earth. And the Lord smit him. God did get him, wake him up out of sleep. Isn't that, that's, that's what I want to happen to my loved one. This is exactly what I want God to do as I pray for them. I want them to be woken out of sleep. I want them to be, uh, 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 I want the keepers to be destroyed from them. I want the Lord to come upon him. I want the light to shine in his life. I want God to smite him if he needs to. And then he raised him up, and um, his chains fell off. What a moment. Um, I remember when I got to lead my, my mom to the Lord. Um, um, it was just before I got married. Kind of, I'll just give you a short story of that. Um, I was out. Uh, it was just the week before I was going to get married, and, um, and I was living at, at home, and I went outside to wash the car. And, um, and I never, I, I, I've led me, I led my cousin to the Lord. I think I led maybe one other person to the Lord in my, in my life. Um, you know, I, I wasn't like a soul winner. I wasn't, I didn't know, I didn't really know what to say or do. I, I just, I, I knew how I was saved. I've been praying for my mom for a long time and um, we'd had some conversations and stuff about it. But, um, so anyway, so I'm going out there, I got this white little bucket and I'm filling it with suds. And I'm going to wash my car, and I'm feeling I'm feeling it, and it, it wasn't God audibly speaking, nothing like that. But you know, God speaks to your heart, and and He said He says He says you need to go talk to your mom right now. And and I'm just like, oh, <laughs> uh, I, I I know what He was saying. I know what He was talking about. I said, um, are you sure, God? And he says, if when you leave, there'll be nobody to talk to her. So anyway, so I just turned off the hose, and I walked in, and I walked up the stairs to, to my house, and my mom was ironing um, in, in my sister's bedroom, and she was just ironing something in there, and I walked into the room, and I said, Mom, I said, I need to talk to you about something, and she looked up at me. She's got tears already in her eyes, and she says, I know. Man, wow. so anyway, so the water work started happening right there with me. She's already crying. I start crying, and I said, "Mom, let me get my Bible." And I'm, I got the I got my little red Bible, my Sunday school Bible that I had uh, for just growing up. That was the Bible that I had, and 
and I'm showing, I'm trying to show her verses in the Bible on how she can be saved, and both both tears are just going down her face. And you know how it is when you're crying, you know, snot going on everywhere. <laughs> I mean, it is just like a gross scene, right? But. But right there, I, just, I, got, I got through the verses. She prayed. She got saved. That was like, that was years of prayer. Years of prayer. But it was that time the chains fell off. The chains finally fell off. And that's what this will do. The chains fell off. The next thing you get to know, look at verse, um, look at verse, uh, uh, where is that? Verse 8. It's interesting. We won't get into a lot of this. Maybe, maybe at some point in the coming weeks we'll get into this. But he says, gird thyself. Um, bind on your sandals. If you were to go to uh, um, if you were to go to Ephesians and take on the whole armor of God, bind on your sandals. Um, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Gird thyself in the same chapter. Gird up thy loins. Um, in there, it's like, hey, put some clothes on, man. And um, uh, that's important to God. Um, and uh, and so anyway, bind on thy sandals. And then it says, um, so he did. That's what that guy said. He said, old there. So he did. Most people, most Christians in America have a really difficult time with that. We won't go there. But that, when, when a Christian starts making those decisions... Some chains fell off. Anyways, we won't go there, but we might go there in <laughs> coming weeks. But just notice what happened here. Notice what happened here. If you've ever seen a Christian get catch on fire for the Lord and has an honest heart for something, this is what happens. They get saved. They start thinking, hey, man, I got to clean, clean up. The Lord looks on the heart, but man looks on the outside. I got to clean up my outside as well as my inside. No, nobody knows what happened on the inside, but my outside is going to show it. And so they get this, and they start making decisions for the Lord. Tough ones. These are difficult. It, it's, it's funny how dress is it's kind of a, in, in, in all reality, it's a trivial thing, but it is one of the main things that really has a lot to do with somebody's direction in the Christianity. But anyway, we won't go there today. Gird thyself. Find on sandals. Uh, uh, so he did. Cast his garment. I guess I should have put that on here. Cast his garment about himself, all right? The angel did not want Peter walking around the prison like he was when he was in the prison. Yeah. That's the bottom line. I mean, you can pitch, don't picture it. Um, um, he doesn't want him that way. All right? <coughs> and so the angel made sure he had some clothes, some decent clothes uh, to uh, dress himself with. And then he says, follow me. What a big step. And then he went and followed Man, isn't this what we want for all of all yeah. of the people that we're praying for? All of our converts? Things like this? But it happens with this. This was the cause and the effect. And the thing I wanted to notice about this here, let's specifically look at the story. We all have personal prayer time that we do that. Not to say that that um, is, will not do this as well. Because the praying without ceasing could have been a combination of personal prayer time and uh, there were probably people when Peter was in prison, and he still had to go to work a job. They still had to go do things. <clears throat> so this could have been praying all over the place. But the thing that God records here specifically was people gathered in a location together praying. And that happened. And if you start looking at the recipe of what happens here is there is a lot of power in the church gathering together to pray. What went on here on New Year's night was awesome, you guys. I don't know if you heard preachers. There were 140 people here starting in the first hour uh, from 7 to 8 o'clock. Many of you um, came to that and then uh, certainly realized it's hard to stay up late sometimes um, and doing that and you got children and all kinds of other logistics to do. But there was a there was a pretty good group that stayed all the way to the end. Had two, we had two. We had um, um, prayer time from ten o'clock to twelve o'clock, bringing in the new year. Um, I can guarantee you, God noticed that. God didn't just go, "Oh yeah, this big Baptist praying again." <laughs> no, no, no. God was like, "Hmm, hey, hey, heaven, angels, get around here, come over here right now. We got to do something about this." That's what went on on New Year's night. 
something's going to happen. God, God is not going to... Look, when we get there, God's not afraid to be held accountable to his promises. He's not afraid of us. If I go, if I will go to, if I go up to God and say, God, hey, what happened as a result of those prayers on New Year's night? He's not going to be going, oh man, did I, did I answer any of that? <laughs> He's going to say, come here, let me show you what happened. And we're not going to get to all see it right now, but that's how sure His promises are. It's okay to hold God accountable. Yep. God's not scared of us uh, uh, in doing that, <clears throat> and uh, we can come boldly to His yep. throne. Um, and lay these things down. Uh, uh, preacher even mentioned this, I think New Year's night or maybe last night. I can't remember when he, or so many, and I can't remember when he mentioned this, but this was really a good point. And, and you guys probably, if you're like at all like me, the devil tries to convince us that we're unworthy to go to him like that. That's right. And he tries to convince us of that. And so, um, but it's not true. Uh, we are unworthy. We're unworthy to be saved. We're unworthy to... I mean, that, that, that was already settled a long time ago, that we're unworthy. But God, in our unworthiness, said, come boldly. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. He said, come, and said, come anyway, man. He says, I, I need you to pray so I can work. And uh, um, I'll have to save that story. I'll... Um, I'll, I'll close with this one story. This uh, I heard this story a long time ago. Um, I can't tell you whether it's... I can't tell you of any first-hand information about it. I heard it um, <clears throat> in a sermon, but I, it was just something that stuck with me. There was a visiting missionary who uh, who was visiting the church. He was telling about this story, how he had gone to get some supplies in town. And he went in town to get the supplies. And um, um, as he was leaving town, there were... Um, there were some people who knew that he uh, had money and that he was just coming from town with all the supplies. And so they were going to jump him on his way back to the village where he taught. And so um, anyway, so he went on his way and they were lying in wait for him and it didn't happen. And so um, he just went and got there um, and then he went back like the next month or whatever. He goes back and gets supplies. And... Um, he ran into one of the people who were going to jump him, and he confronted him in the city. And he said, "Hey," he said, um, "He said uh, I had a level with you. He says we were going to jump you the day that you came last month." And he said, um, "He says, but he says, where did you hire those soldiers?" <laughs> and he didn't know what he was talking about. He says, uh, "You know, he didn't know." He, he said, "No, I just I want to know where you hired those soldiers." And he says, yeah, he says, there were, there, were, there were eight of them. I can't remember the number, but there were eight of them that were surrounding you. He says, we were going to jump you. He says, there's no way. They were armed. There's no way we were going to win. He said, I had a group of guys with me, but we were counting. We were saying, hey, look, that ain't, this ain't going to work. <clears throat> and so he didn't know it. So anyway, so this missionary was um, in the States telling the story of uh, this church. And, uh, and uh, um, this guy in the middle of the service stands up. He kind of raises his hand. He says, um, he says, hey, uh, um, he says, when did that happen? And uh, he interrupted his sermon. And he says, when did that happen? He says, well, about this day and this day. And he just kind of sits in his head. And he, says, he says, can I tell you a story? And, he, and the, the missionary's kind of like, whoa. He just interrupted the service, right? <laughs> you know how that is. Like, can I tell you a story right in the middle of the service? And, um, and so he says, well, go ahead. And, uh, and he, says, he says, on this day, he says, um, he says, I was on the golf course. He says, I was on the golf course, I was on the putting green, and um, and the Lord told me to just pray for you. He says, but I'm on the golf course. He says, I can't just like stop and like, pray for you. So was, what I did is I, I sent a text to um, eight of, of the deacons that were in the church. And he sent or he sent the text to or he sends the text out and he says, please pray for so and so. And so, anyways, and he says. Um, he says, if you're here today, he says, can I just ask who prayed for him on this day? And eight people stood up. <laughs> now, I can't tell you firsthand that story is true. I just know um, I heard that story. I, I can believe that story based on what God says. But don't you think it meant something for eight people to be praying for him at that point? We don't know what God does. We don't. 
We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We, we, always, think, we always think it's us. We always think it's our efforts, and, and there is a measure of our effort that happens to a degree. But this is where God works. This is where the power of God comes in to all the labor and effort that we produce. Um, we can labor, we can work, we can spin our wheels, but without the power of God doing this kind of work on our heart, it's not going to work. This is really what has to happen. And so prayer, um, I just uh, if we could just all kind of take on this challenge in these next few days to say, you know what, I want my prayer life to count more than it has. I want, it to, I want it to count for more. And um, so anyways, I'm going to let you go. We'll, uh, we'll talk more about these subjects um, later on. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the, <clears throat> the truths that you put in here. And um, thank you, Lord. For